Has the Lord been good to you? Come on, has he blessed you? Has he kept you? Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, we magnify you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God's been really good to me. He's been really good to me. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, if it had not been for the Lord, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be at CLC today. Come on, somebody testify with me right now. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord. God. Feels so good to be in his house today. Just I'm thankful for his presence, for what we experience when we come together in his house, when we magnify him together. And so good to see each of you, the house of the Lord today. I want to take just a moment and express appreciation to everyone for all of your hard work, everything that was invested to help make last weekend very special. And, uh, certainly was very special for our family and I believe an important time for our church I believe the things that God did Saturday night Sunday right here in our midst I believe that the will of God was accomplished in those services and just a very dynamic demonstration of the Holy Ghost I believe lives were touched and changed forever we had several receive the Holy Ghost in services Kinsey and Taven Moore received the Holy Ghost, and Ava Parks received the Holy Ghost. I'm not sure if she even came out to the front, but wherever she was, God filled her with the Holy Ghost last Sunday. So beautiful. I love the way our children and our young people respond in worship. That tells me that there's some moms and some dads that are doing a good job putting some things in them at home and not just what happens here at church. So I, I commend our parents for doing a great job putting some things into our young people, our children, a love for God, love for the church. Our choir did an incredible job last night, represented us all so well at the Davis Shea House. That house will never be the same after our choir was there last night. I don't think they knew what was coming. I don't think they knew what hit them when it was done, but it was good. We felt the Holy Ghost in the Davis Shea House. And I promise you, everybody that was there left knowing that they had felt God, that I believe that there were some seeds sown in those lives. And somebody today is probably trying to figure out, where is that church? I believe that. There, somebody's going to come that experienced something last night. This is a special time of the year, special season. You know, as we were singing last night, they, they had asked our choir to sing some non-Christmas songs along with a few Christmas songs. But I got to thinking, you know, for us, they're all Christmas songs. I mean, we're, we're singing about Jesus, right? They're all Christmas songs. Where we're talking about why he came. We've been singing Christmas songs today all day. It's the reason that we had a Savior who took on flesh who walked this earth, who died for our sins. It is a special time of special emphasis upon the reason that he came. So many wonderful things that will be coming up this week and in the following week, special parties and, and services. And we appreciate each of you who are involved in those and helping make those possible. Appreciate your, your prayer and support for our family. It has been, no doubt, one of the more unique weeks of our lives, incredible time of celebration last weekend, and, and on Tuesday, the memorial service for my father-in-law, and it was a very, very special time, and uh, really an incredible moment to honor just an amazing life. As I looked over the crowd that day, and uh, the church would seat about 400, and they were bringing in chairs, and probably 500 or so that showed up that day to honor him, and kind of the cross-section of those that showed up that day, there were probably several dozen ministers that were there. My father-in-law was not a, a minister, wasn't a preacher, 
but he was a friend of ministry and a supporter of ministry and of missionaries and evangelists and different ones who would come through. And there were several dozen pastors and ministers that were there, district superintendent and leaders that were there to honor what we would call a layman, not a minister, but someone who impacted the kingdom greatly because of his love for God and his giving and support of the kingdom. And we appreciate your prayers so much for, for our family, for Sister Rebecca. And we're very, very honored today to have my mother-in-law who is here, who uh, made the trip back this week. I thank God for my mother-in-law, Martha Lee Lyman, and I ask her just to greet you today. I know not everyone probably will get the chance to meet her, but we're honored that she would come and be in service with us, going to be with us for a few days, and I thank God for her and uh, all that she invested in Sister Rebecca to help make her who she is. And I uh, thank God for my family. They're, they're not outlaws. They're definitely in-laws. And uh, I love and appreciate them very much. Sister Martha Lee, would you greet CLC today? Wow, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for loving my daughter and her beautiful family. Thank you so much for praying for us. I know that you all are well acquainted with grief. And I appreciate your prayers probably more than all the other ones that came my way. I feel your strength. I feel the prayers lifting us. And um, sometimes the tears will stop, won't they? Yeah, they'll stop. It's a little fresh now, so forgive me. But I'll be back, and I hope it over the years, if the Lord tarries, to get a chance to meet each and every one of you and to... Uh, Thank you again for loving our family and for your prayers during this time of grief. I just wish you could have met her daddy. He was amazing. And his greatest desire was to come to Heath. So, baby, if you're there, here we are. You know? I just want to say that most of my daughter's wonderful traits did come from her father. <laughs> he just loved to give to the kingdom of God, as Brother Enzi has said, and uh, I've got to fill his shoes somehow, so I covet your continual prayers, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. God bless you, and Merry, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Why don't we just give praise and thanks to God right now? He's a good God. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love toward us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We're going to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. specific word for us today for somebody at CLC this morning it's not going to be a Christmas themed message we may get to, to that Wednesday and in the coming weeks but I believe God wants to give hope and encouragement to someone today from 2 Chronicles chapter 20 beginning in verse number 1 after this the Moabites and Ammonites and with them some of the Munites came against Jehoshaphat for battle some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, and your hand are might and are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. 
Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I want to focus your attention to verse number 12 in this moment of transparency. Jehoshaphat and his cry unto God simply said, I don't know what to do. I don't have the answers. I don't have the resources. I can't figure it out. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I want to preach to somebody today from this subject, what to do when you just don't know what to do. Those moments come. Life has a way of asking us questions that we don't have answers for. But there are some things that we can do when we don't know what to do. The Holy Ghost is reaching for somebody, touching somebody's heart right now. I feel it so strongly. God wants you to know you came today without answers. You came today without direction. But God wants you to know there's something you can do when you really aren't sure what to do. Would you pray with me right now? The Holy Ghost would help us that his word would speak to us, that he would give us direction in the spirit today. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we magnify you, Jesus. Speak to us today. God, give hope, assurance from your word today that you're in control. Hallelujah. We trust you, Jesus. We look to you, Jesus. We don't know what to do, but we look to you. We turn our eyes, our attention to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just give him thanks right now? Oh, give him praise. Hallelujah. We magnify you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God for Google. When you need an answer, Google is there. Now, I don't know if you'll get the right answer, but you can get an answer. Google is there. I was reading recently about Google. They process several trillion searches every year. And that number is growing. Several trillion searches every year on Google. And yet, in their analysis, in their study of those analytics, they have discovered that over 15% of those trillions of searches is unique every year. Over 15% of those trillions of searches since the beginning of Google is a search that has never been made before. A question that no one has ever asked before. 15% out of trillions of questions have never been asked. Humanity is on a quest for information. Seeking to find solutions for problems, trying to discover the best response for their particular dilemma. We Google everything. When you've lost the instructions, you Google to find them. When you can't figure something out, you Google to find the answer. A few days ago, I was trying to figure out the keypad on my garage, and a previous owner didn't leave that keypad code for us, and I'm trying to figure it out, so I googled how to reset the keypad on my garage. 
We Google everything to try to discover the answers. As I was reading this article about Google, I discovered that their greatest competitor in the search world, their biggest competitor is not Yahoo or Microsoft Bing. It's Amazon. Because Amazon has discovered and figured out a way to monetize this insatiable search for information to not only provide information, but to attach a product with it that you can purchase to help you figure out your problem. Amazon Prime is of the devil, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> that you can just go find something, order it, and it's on your doorstep tomorrow. It's too easy to spend money, especially during the Christmas season. But thank God, you don't even have to go to the store. You don't have to fight that traffic in those people. Just order it on Amazon. But Amazon is Google's biggest competitor as a search engine. When you don't know what to do, there has to be some kind of response. In the animal kingdom, the law of survival prevails and the strongest survive. And we've discovered in our research of the animal kingdom... There's a variety of defense mechanisms, natural responses, these innate responses that protect them against predators or help them to gain a, a meal in the evening time. And some methods of defense may be passive. They use disguises or deceit to fool its enemy into retreat. There are different animals that will use camouflage to just kind of melt away into their surroundings. Others with the coloring of their skin, like the white coat of the Arctic fox or the polar bear that will use their coloring to just blend into their surroundings. There's the green color of the tree frog that helps it to blend in. Another passive method of defense is used by various animals like the cuttlefish or the squid that will use an ejection of ink to hide them and to allow them to escape from their adversary. There's even an animal called the sea cucumber that has a very unique defense mechanism. They actually regurgitate their innards, just empty themselves out, and then grow a new stomach. The sea cucumber. That's just strange and kind of disgusting. A more direct line of defense for various animals will be weapons that they use to defend themselves, the antler, the tusk, or horns that they will use to duel their enemies, to ward away those that would attack them. Some animals have vicious claws that they will use. Other animals have the ability to ward off predators at a very long range, such as the skunk. It uses its horrific putrid odor as a defense mechanism. Many of the features common to most of these animals used in another common feature that some animals have used in their defense mechanisms are their feet or their tail like kangaroos or lizards or alligators. As you can see, nature has provided these animals with a means of defense and perhaps even a means to attack but there is one particular type of animal that I was amazed to find its defense mechanism. It actually has the ability to explode. There's a certain type of ant that will explode in the face of its enemy. It'll take one for the team <laughs> to save the whole colony of ants. Now that's a defense mechanism right there. Some of you have met people who have that ability. That that's their defense mechanism. They they just explode. See, humanity also has innate within us this in instinctive nature, perhaps instinctive, more instinctive within our fallen nature, a defense mechanism. There is that fight or flight mentality. Maybe you could even add the 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 freeze mentality. Fight or or flight or freeze, that you will, you will lash out or you will run or maybe you'll just be paralyzed with fear. It is a, a defense mechanism. Our body responds in a particular way when we feel threatened, when we feel like we are in danger, the fight, flight, or freeze response. You begin to dig a little bit deeper into the human psyche and find that there are other means that we have of coping, 
other means that we have developed of dealing with those moments of helplessness and uncertainty, other ways that we will try to cope with the pain, to cope with hurt, or to find a way to escape danger when we feel threatened. There is the denial response. To attempt to completely reject a thought or feeling, kind of to stick our head in the sand and act like a problem doesn't exist. We will bury it deep inside and hope that it never resurfaces again, but somehow, somewhere, it eventually does resurface. Typically, in the most inopportune times, old feelings and old fears will rear their ugly head during times of stress or sorrow. Denial simply doesn't work as a defense Mechanism. There is the rationalization response where we'll try to come up with various explanations to justify a particular situation to try to cope with those feelings and those realities. But ultimately, at the end of the day, justification or rationalization doesn't deal with the reality of the issues that we're facing. It's not a good enough response. I, I want to tell somebody today that it's okay to say, I don't know. It's all right to say, I don't have it all figured out. It's okay to come to that place, uh, that reality, that response to say, I just don't know what to do. It's all right. It's not a, a sign of weakness. Doesn't mean you're backslid. Doesn't mean you don't know God. It is to come to that place of reality to say, I don't know. It's just a place of transparency and honesty with God. I think too often a fear of our perception or, or our fear of others' perception of us that we don't have the answers, that we don't have it all figured out has caused too many people to live a life of bondage and frustration and disappointment because they were too afraid to simply say, I don't know. That unwillingness to get to that place of honesty has caused many to never ask questions that needed to be asked to seek answers that needed to be found. It's okay to say I don't know. It's okay to say I'm not sure what to do, but I believe the word of God gives us from the life of Jehoshaphat some insight into what we can do when we're not sure what to do, what we can do when we're not sure what the answers are. Before we get to that place of what we can do, though, I think we need to eliminate some options of what not to do. There are some things that you need to, to not do if you're unsure. There are some things that you need to refrain from doing if you don't really know what to do. First of all, don't quit. <laughs> Quitting is never a good option. Throwing in the towel is never a good option. If you're not sure what to do today, if you don't have the answers today, whatever you do, don't stop. Whatever you do, don't quit. Whatever you do, don't give in. Eliminate quitting from your vocabulary. Eliminate it as an option in your life. Don't quit. It's never the right response. Failure is only fatal and it's only final when you give up. There's no failure in trying. You can't beat somebody who just won't stay down. You can't win against somebody who just won't stay down. Don't quit. That's never the right response. Don't attack others. Don't project your feelings, what you may even be feeling about yourself toward others. Why, why do we hurt those that we love the most when we're under stress, when pressure comes, when circumstances arise? Sometimes it seems like that that's just the case. We lash out against those that we love the most. One of the reasons that that is is simply just the fact that those that we love the most and those that love us the most have the greatest potential for hurt. I mean, if, if, if just some guy walks in off the street and just is angry with me, starts cussing me out, I, I'm probably going to be a little offended, but it's not going to hurt me. Be like, bro, what is up? What's happening, man? Cool down. It's all right. 
I, I don't know him. It, it, I, I don't know him, don't, don't love him. That, it, it's not really going to hurt. Now, if Sister Rebecca did that, she never has, I promise you. She, she's never done that. That would hurt. Man, I, I would be, I, I need a therapist or something. I would be damaged. It's those that are close to us that have the greatest potential for us to hurt. So be careful in those moments when pressure comes and circumstances arise that we don't lash out at others, that we don't direct our feelings toward others. Even somebody who may be projecting those feelings against us so many times, that we're not really the problem, and the issue isn't really the issue. There's something deeper that's at work there. So be careful in those moments when you don't know what to do. Attacking somebody else is never a good option. Attacking those that you love is never a good option. That's when you need to bring them close. That's when you need to get a hold of those that you love the most and bring them closer to you and say, hey, we're going to get through this together. Number three, don't change your belief system. To justify your behavior or to try to make yourself feel better based on circumstances that you're dealing with. Don't change what you believe just to try to justify that behavior. If your current issues and problems are the result of bad decisions, change your behavior. Don't change your beliefs. Stop what you're doing if actions, if decisions have led you into circumstances that are causing guilt or shame or creating problems. Stop the behavior. Don't change your belief system. That's only going to complicate the issues and, and the problems. In fact, that's simply what repentance is. It's to just stop doing what I'm doing that's causing problems. And to make a decision to go a different direction when you're not sure what to do. Don't change your belief system. That's when you need to go back to the Word of God and stand upon the foundation of truth. We don't change what we believe to justify what we're doing. No, we want to change what we're doing to line up with the Word of God. It'll take care of a whole lot of issues. It'll take care of a whole lot of problems. Thank you, Brother JP, for that word that you preached to us, taught to us in our lesson today about the wrath of God. But it's the gospel that takes care of that wrath. It's the gospel that gives us hope. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us hope today that we don't have to live in guilt. We don't have to live in shame. We don't have to live in sin and in bondage. Because the gospel, it gives us hope. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? Maybe you've tried everything else. Maybe you've tried every other option. Life would like to provide the quick fix and the temporary solution. But so often those just leave us with more questions than we started with. When life comes asking those difficult questions... Those challenging circumstances. You can't Google enough to find all the right answers. You can't reason your way through the pain and explain away the guilt. It just brings more confusion. Thank God for modern medicine, but it only provides temporary relief. You can't drown the memory of your failures in alcohol. It just multiplies your sorrows. You can't get high enough on drugs to get over your insecurities. It just makes you more vulnerable. You may have tried to buy your way out of some challenging circumstances, but the more money you try to get, the more you become lost. The more debt that accumulates, it brings more more fear and frustration. You may have tried to enter, entertain your way through some depressing moments, but that depression only deepens. And I want to give you some hope today that there is an answer, that there is a response, that there are some things that you can do when you just don't know what to do. Not the answers that the world is going to provide, not the answers that your flesh is going to crave, but some answers from the Word of God that can give you the direction that you need.
As we look into 2 Chronicles chapter 20, armies have aligned themselves against Jehoshaphat and the kingdom of Judah, marching against Judah to do battle. At that time, Judah is completely defenseless. They have no army that is prepared. They have no answers that they could come up with on their own. And it's here at this moment, this critical moment, that Jehoshaphat cries to the Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't have the answers. We don't have the resources. and We don't know what to do. But I'm thankful that he gave us an example of what we can do in that moment. He was powerless to do anything about the army that he was facing. But he did not allow that fear or doubt to paralyze him. But there are several things that Jehoshaphat did that give us some hope today. How we can respond in that moment. First of all, you look at verses 3, 4, and 5. Jehoshaphat went to the house of the Lord. He went to church. It says in verse number 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid. It's okay to be afraid. That just means you're human. It's all right to be afraid. Just don't let that fear paralyze you. Don't let that fear control you. Jehoshaphat was afraid, but he wasn't paralyzed. He set his face to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He assembled Judah to seek help from the Lord. All the cities of Judah came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court. Jehoshaphat went to church. He said, my first response, when I don't know what to do, I'm going to church. I'm going to get together with the people of God. When I don't know what to do, I'm not going to quit going to church. When I don't know what to do, I'm not going to run from the church. When I don't know what to do, I'm not going to quit or throw in the towel. I'm going to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I'm going to church. I'm going to worship. I'm going to give. I'm going to serve. You know, most of the excuses that we come up with for why we just can't go to church should be at the top of our list for why we should go to church. Most of the reasons and justifications and things that we can come up with for why I just can't make it today, well, we can come up with some reasons. And we get creative. When we want to justify something, we can get incredibly creative. We can come up with all kinds of reasons and justifications. But Jehoshaphat, here he is, defenseless. The enemy is approaching, and his first response is, I'm going to the house of God. I'm going to the church. And it, it, it doesn't have to just be on Sunday. If you ever find yourself in a moment of crisis, and you just feel like you need to go to the church, if you don't have a key, call somebody who has a key and just go to the house of God. There's just something about coming into his house. There's something about what happens here in this place. I know God's everywhere. We feel him in our home. We feel him on the job. We feel him in the car, wherever. But there's something about his house. There's something about this place. There's something about the altar at the house of God where we get direction, where we find hope and healing. The first thing we ought to do when we don't know what to do is let's go to church. The writer of Hebrews said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching in this environment that we're living in. We need church more than ever in this culture that we're a part of. All the different voices, all the challenges, all of the pressure that we feel around us. We need the house of God more than ever. Go to the house of God. The second thing that Jehoshaphat began to do, we see in verses 6 through 9, he began to pray. And I love his prayer. Because his prayer wasn't a, a, a pity party. His prayer wasn't a complaint session. His, his prayer was not blaming God. He just began to remind God of his promises. And who he was. He said, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? 
You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? You gave it forever to your descendants of Abraham, your friend. Remember your friend Abraham? Remember the promises that you gave him and they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name. It's saying if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and you will save. Prayer just works. Prayer works. Why does prayer have to be our last resort? Well, prayer should be our first resort because prayer just works. Jehoshaphat goes to the house of God and he starts to pray and he says, I know that you're God over heaven and of earth. You have all power and you have all ability. God, I remember the promises. Do you remember the promise that you gave me? Do you remember what you spoke into my spirit? I've come to claim those promises. Jehoshaphat begins to pray. He said, we're praying because we know that you will hear and you will save. We're praying because we know God answers prayer. I believe God answers every prayer. He doesn't always answer the way that we want him to answer, but he answers every prayer. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's maybe. Sometimes it's wait. But God answers Prayer. Prayer just works. I was reading an, an article from Newsweek about the power of prayer. It was a surprising place to find that kind of article. But some doctors who had done a study of different patients, and unbeknownst to the patients, they had a segment of people that were praying for some patients and not for others. And they got through the end of the test, and they said those that had prayer for them were better off than those that didn't. They said this was not a test of God. It was just a test of prayer. They said, we can't, we can't enter into that arena and test what God did, but we know that prayer works. Prayer works. Thank God for those who have discovered the power of prayer. Thank God for our prayer warriors. Thank God for those who know how to go into battle in prayer. You know who they are. They're the ones that you're calling when you have a need. They're the ones that you're reaching out to when you have a need. Thank God for those who understand that prayer has to be our response. When I don't know what to do, I can pray. When I don't know where to go, I can pray. When I don't have the answer, I know who has the answer. Prayer just works. Prayer works. And there are those times when we're not even sure what to pray. But Paul would tell the Romans that the Spirit itself helpeth with our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are some times we don't know what to do and we're not even sure what to pray. But we enter into that realm of the Spirit and we begin to pray in the Spirit. We begin to talk to God in the Spirit. We're not even sure what to ask for. We're not even sure what to pray. But we know we can pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit itself prayeth for us. The Spirit begins to pray through us. And we begin to seek God. We're not even sure what we're praying for. But we know when we tap into the Spirit. And we know when God begins to work in the Spirit. That's why it's so important that we pray in the spirit. One of my friends who was here last Sunday, Micah Adams, sometime I'll tell you the whole, I'll tell you the whole story, tell you his whole testimony. It's incredible. It's amazing. But when we were having a discussion one time about prayers, what led us to a Bible study where he, he received the Holy Ghost, I, we began to talk about prayer. He, he had grown up in church and he, he asked me, he said, I want you to teach me how to pray. Kind of blew my mind. He had been around church his whole life. I thought, this, this guy knows how to pray. He said, I want you to teach me how to pray. He said, nobody's ever taught me how to pray. And we began to talk about prayer, and I began to talk to him about praying in the Spirit. So you got to pray in the Spirit. He said, well, what does that mean? 
said, well, just, just pray till you break through in the Spirit. And the Spirit begins to speak through you. And you begin to speak in tongues. And you pray in the Spirit. He said, well, I have the Holy Ghost, but I don't speak in tongues. So, well, I got a Bible study for you that I want to teach. I think God wants to give you a little bit more revelation and understanding about praying in the Spirit. It's so important that we pray in the Spirit because we, if we only pray with our understanding and our knowledge, we will fall short of, of what God desires to pray through us. But we can pray some things in the Spirit that we're not even aware of. God may want to use your prayers to pray for somebody across town, across the world, who's in need at that particular moment. He wakes you up in the middle of the night, and you enter into a time and a season of praying in the Spirit. Prayer works. Prayer makes a difference. Our response when we don't know what to do should be prayer. We find a New Testament example. On the day of Pentecost, we see gathered these Jews, devout men, the Bible calls them out of every nation under heaven, who have gathered together for that feast of Pentecost. And as God begins to pour out his spirit on the church, and they begin to pour out of the upper room, and it is noised abroad what is happening. Peter begins to preach on the day of Pentecost. And as he concludes his, his message that day, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The Bible says when that group of religious people heard that message that day, they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We don't know what to do. The realization hits them. They've crucified their Messiah. They're not sure what to do. Peter said, here's what you can do when you're not sure what to do. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. When you don't know what to do, repentance is a good place to start. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, that'd be a good thing to do, to be buried in his name for the remission of your sins. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, that's a good thing to start with. Let him fill you with his spirit if you're not really sure what to do. The last thing Jehoshaphat prayed was, he said, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. He said, I don't know what to do, but I know where to look. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. The psalmist said, Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes. To the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. You may not know what to do today, but I encourage you to lift up your eyes, to look just beyond the hills to where our help comes from. The writer of Hebrews said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He knows the end from the beginning. He didn't just start us on this course, but he's going to finish this course. He which hath begun a good work in you, he will finish it. I want you to look at God's response in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse number 13. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow 
tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them and the Lord will be with you. He said, when you've done everything that you can do, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You see, there does come a point where you just need to stop. God, I've done everything that I can do. Now, I'm just going to stand back and I'm going to watch you. I'm just going to stand back and see you work. I came to your house. I prayed a prayer of faith and I've looked toward you. Now, God, I'm just going to step back and watch you do your work. It's at this point. It's at this point you just have to trust God. Because when you attempt to do more than you can do, you start entering into God's realm. You start getting into his business. When we get to that place, okay, God, I've been faithful, I've prayed, I've done what I could do. Now, I'm just gonna stand still and watch you do what only you can do. Watch you work the way that only you can work. God said, okay, I've seen your faithfulness and I've heard your prayer. Just stand back. You're not even going to have to fight in this battle. In fact, the only thing that they did, we find the final piece that brings it all together. The Bible says in verse number 18, 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat bows his head with his face to the ground. All Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fall down before the Lord and they begin to worship the Lord. The Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets, prof, prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. He said, Jehoshaphat said, okay, we've, we've come to the house of God. We've prayed. God has responded. He's given us this promise that he's going to work on our behalf, that everything's going to turn out all right. Now, he said, this is how we're going to enter into worship, enter into the battle. We're going to come as worshipers. We're going to come with praise unto God. We're going to come with hands raised, with voices lifted, with hearts open, and we're going to see God do his work. We're going to see God work the miracle. We're going to see God win the battle. There's somebody today, you came to church and you weren't really sure what to do. You came today seeking answers, looking for a solution today. God's speaking to somebody right now. You came to the right place. You came to the right place today. You're in the right atmosphere for God to fight that battle for you. You can't fight it on your own. But if you'll just lift your hands in complete and supreme trust to God. God, I don't know what to do, so here I am today, casting my cares upon you. God, I've come today. God, I'm looking, in, I'm looking toward you. I'm lifting my eyes toward heaven. God, I'm praying today for you to step in and intervene. God, I'm going to come with worship. I'm going to come with praise. I want to open this altar right now to some worshipers today. Is there anybody that would like to just step out into the battlefield with worship? Would you like to step out into that battlefield today with worship? Come on, Jehovah. Jehovah's on your side. 
Jehovah's fighting for you. Jehovah has the answer. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your voice. He's fighting that battle for you.
There's no one like our God. So many times in various Old Testament passages, we would see where the, the people of God are in battle, and often God would give instruction for them to get into position, to get into to place through obedience. And sometimes it didn't really make a whole lot of sense, like walking around Jericho's walls for six days and not seeing anything happen. But he would give them instruction that seventh day, I, I want you to get into position. For some reason, it took them seven days to get into posi position where he wanted them. When he finally got them in that place of position, they were obedient. They were a position of trust, submission. Like, okay, God, we're in position. It was at that moment that he would have them give a shout. And when they were in the right position, unified in that position, they gave a shout of praise. That's when the answer would come. That's when the, the walls would fall. That's when the heavens would open. That's when the fire would fall. That's when God would respond. When they got into position, they were obedient to the voice of God. They trusted the voice of, of God and got into that position and gave a shout of praise and their breakthrough came. The battle was won. Victory came in that moment. I feel like God has brought us to that place, to that, that position for somebody today. In just a moment, I'm gonna invite us to lift up our voice together to give a great shout of praise and thanks to God. Whether you're in the altar area or throughout the congregation today, I want you to join with us. And when you let out that shout, let it be a shout of faith and expectation that God is going to provide, that He's going to answer, that you're going to have the breakthrough that you need, that the miracle is going to come, the healing is going to come. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your voice together. Would you let out a shout? Come on, let out a cry unto our God. Yes. Yes.
Oh, somebody thank him right now. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for that breakthrough today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. just a, a deep ministering move the Holy Ghost right now I want to move too quickly just let the Holy Ghost just begin to speak to somebody right now let the Spirit of God just give you some direction right now hallelujah we've celebrated the breakthrough we've celebrated the victory that God brings just let the Spirit of God just speak into your heart right now. Somebody needs that, that still small voice of the Spirit just to give you that assurance right now. Maybe somebody, you don't feel that breakthrough today. Don't feel like you've won that battle yet. God wants to give you that assurance right now. He hears your prayer. He will hear. He will answer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Just keep believing. Just keep believing. Oh, I know he's going to see you through. Oh, just know that you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Oh, yes. Just keep believing. Just don't know. And you don't know what to do. Just keep believing.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for that assurance. Thank you for that promise today. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you for the peace that you give us, not as the world gives, but you give perfect peace today. It's a peace that passes our understanding. When we don't know, we can still have peace. When we don't understand, we can still have peace. And we thank you for it, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. If you're not living there today, that day will come when you're just not sure what to do. When you find yourself in that moment, the Word of God has armed us, has equipped us with the right response. When we're not sure what to do, go to the house of God. Go back to prayer one more time. You may say, well, I've prayed before. Keep on praying. Jesus said, ask and seek and knock. You never know how many times we have to knock, but at some point, the door is going to be open. Just keep knocking. Keep praying. Keep believing in what you know. What a powerful message. When you don't know what to do, keep believing what you do know. I do know He is faithful. I know He's good. I know He's in control. I know He's able. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're so grateful for each one of you, for the wonderful family of God. It's in times like this and when you face those struggles and challenges that you have that, that personal revelation all over again of how valuable it is to be part of His body, to be part of the family of God. We feel the strength and support of your prayers, your love. A lot of things going on this week and the coming weeks. Remember all those announcements. We'll be informing you of each of the upcoming parties and special services next Sunday. Going to be a great time. Our Christmas musical. Invite somebody to come with you. That that neighbor, that friend, that coworker, that fellow student at your school that you've been looking for the right opportunity to invite them to church this coming Sunday. It'd be a great time to bring your friends, your family. To be part of a wonderful Christmas celebration this next weekend. Praise God. Brother Chuck, anything else? We good? Choir this afternoon. Remember that today. Find somebody this week to invite to come to church with you. This is we're we're here in this community to be a light, to be a witness, to be salt in somebody's life. Take that opportunity that you'll have this week to share with them the love of Christ. Strengthen one another. Encourage one another in the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed today. In Jesus' name.